Hey there, and welcome back, folks. My first guest tonight is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter and authors of the books War on Peace and Catch and Kill. Please welcome to A Late Show, Ronan Farrow. Ronan, good to see you again. Good to be here, Stephen. Good to see you again. We have, we have not talked during COVID, right? This is the first time we're talking actually under these Zoom conditions, correct? It's been a while. This is, this is weird. It's weird, but good. Now, you have been uh, very busy during lockdown, reporting for The New Yorker on the Capitol attack and also the allegations against Governor Cuomo. Um, let's talk about Cuomo first. How legal is weed going to get in New York just to distract us from what's going on in Albany? It will be mandatory. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. you know, who can say what the future stories bring? Uh, clearly, this is a political team that's very embattled right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of reporters that are continuing to circle. I don't think we've seen the end of that story. Um, you're, you've, we made actually, the, the day before we found out that you were actually doing an article about the governor, I made a joke about the number of accusations against him. It was something like seven at that point. And I said, one more and you get a free article by Ronan Farrow. So... <laughs> Well, your career, your career runs the gamut of subjects. You you have been uh, um, uh, achieved some notoriety for your writing on uh, the uh, abusive behavior of, of men in, in the workplace, mostly. What's that like when you call someone to investigate anything? What what what? Do, how do people react, especially uh, powerful men, when someone says Ronan Farrow's on the phone for you? You know, it, it's a double-edged sword, mostly very grateful because whatever name recognition I have uh, for hopefully doing a thorough job at these kinds of investigative stories sure. uh, makes me want to talk more. Uh, you are correct in surmising that occasionally I will call someone, particularly a prominent person in a position of power, uh, and get a swift hang-up. Uh, or hear from intermediaries that they uh, absolutely under no circumstances will talk to me. So that does happen too. And then, and then there have been a few times where I think, huh, I wonder why. And then a few weeks later, uh, it's very clear why. Well, the, the last time we spoke, you talked about being tailed by literal spies, like, a, like professional spies who have been hired by Weinstein to, to trail around and try to get some sort of dirt on you or to intimidate you in some way. You, you, you've talked to some pretty sketchy characters in, in your day, and then and recently uh, people who actually um, were part of the assault on Capitol Hill on January 6th. What has that been like? Has there been any fallout from those people? Is, is that a threatening situation to be in, to talk face-to-face -to -face with these people who have violence as part of their vocabulary? This is always a tough thing to talk about because I am not a reporter in Pakistan reporting on the secrets of the Pakistani intelligence service. You know, I, I'm not going to get killed tomorrow in the street, probably. Uh, we're very lucky to live in a country with the First Amendment and with great law enforcement. Um, so, you know, this is on the lesser end of the global scale of what journalists go up against. That said, uh, you know, it's worth talking about, I think, that reporters in this country get all sorts of threats. Uh, sometimes they're legal threats, they're, you know, threats of smears in the press. There's also sorts of mechanisms that I've reported on and talked about. Uh, in this case, uh, the story you're mentioning, the, the Capitol riots, I did talk to uh, a number of quite volatile people. I, I think you're probably alluding to uh, one gentleman who, you know, made some threats to my physical safety, which happens. It's an occupational hazard. Well, I... I, I... I agree with you that we're lucky we live in the United States where there is um, generally order and that there is um, law and order. Um, but we saw the limitations of that on January 6th. I'm wondering whether any of the people that you spoke to um, have had a, uh, for lack of a better word, um, and pardon the expression, a come to Jesus on this. Ha have the people you've spoken to in your reporting on the, the aftermath of January 6th, come to a realization that they did the wrong thing? Or have they come to a realization that they were misled? Have they retooled their anger in a new direction? Far from it. You know, there was a poll that came out just a couple of days ago, Stephen, uh, from Reuters, saying that more than half of Republicans across the country, not just people involved in this event, but half of Republicans believe that this was a uh, fake setup, that left-wing activists uh, constructed this riot to make Trump look bad. 
The FBI says very clearly that's not the truth. Uh, I have not in my reporting seen any evidence that there's any truth to that. So when you look at a number like that and see how wide the gulf is between different understandings of these events, you see how this is not a problem and a division that's going to go away. And the sources that I've stayed in touch with uh, have not backed down. Uh, we talked about some of those threats from that, that one gentleman, Donovan Crowell, uh, who's been significant in the ongoing prosecutions because he's a member of the group, the Oath Keepers. So he's part of the, the faction that was there that day that was very organized and seemingly had some pretty intensive intentions in terms of what they were going to do that day. Um, you know, And he's someone who has deeply held beliefs. Uh, there's no indication in his legal filings that he's backing down from those thus far. And, you know, he, he's also someone who said, I studied the shape of your head before I gave an interview to you, uh, and I'm going to eat a family member of yours uh, face. So, you know, there's, there's a whole spectrum of different types of individuals. Very, very charming uh, individual. Uh, he's, he's out uh, on home release, by the way, so that's, that's lovely. Um, did it, did he have any, did he have any opinion about the shape of your skull? Well, I, you know, I didn't press as to whether, uh, his conclusion was my, my skull was so misshapen that he, you know, he felt like he could really, uh, have a conversation on the level with me or, or whether he felt like it was a great skull. Uh, I didn't really go there, but you know, it's not always a totally rational set of beliefs rooted in facts, let's say. Uh, and then, you know, I think that there are, there are subtler factions that were represented that day. And, and that, in some ways, Stephen, is going to be a harder thing to address and root out. What do you mean People a subtler, who, a subtler faction? Well, you know, I think there are people who don't believe in phrenology um, and who uh, are subtler in their rendering of uh, misinformation. You know, they say, well, who can say there was some Antifa and left-wing agitation in the crowd? Uh, you know, that's a significant part of it, even though, again, there's, there's no evidence that that's the case. Um, you know, they, there are actors who were involved that day who are able to sugarcoat this for a broader audience. And what academic researchers on extremism have told me again and again is, during administrations that are liberal, uh, anti-liberal, anti-government groups of the type we saw on January 6th at the Capitol actually have a, a groundswell of support and activity. That we've seen that a lot historically. So, so the Trump it, during the Trump administration, that was not the groundswell, is what you're implying. Yeah, I, th I think it's both. I think that there are extremist groups that were operating under the surface in this country and not getting enough notice uh, within the mainstream press, by the way, uh, that found purchase and legitimacy because of things Trump was saying. And then also, unfortunately, those groups are going to have something to rebel against right now. Do you think that the ability for uh, a new lie on top of the big lie, the idea that the uh, attack has actually was actuated or motivated by people from Antifa or BLM or anarchists of some kind on the left. Do you think that would exist without things like Fox News existing? Fox News is a hugely significant echo chamber. And I tell you, I talked to so many individuals and the family members and friends of those individuals who were there on the Hill that day who said, you know, this is someone who went down a rabbit hole of either constantly listening to and watching Fox News uh, or conservative radio, uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh and his ilk, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the most extreme wing of, of misinformation in this country, you know, Alex Jones and so forth. Um, there, there is a thriving market for misinformation, and it, it shares a lot of elements with, uh, you know, cult psychology. There are people who are being radicalized, much in the same way we saw with, you know, ISIS recruits, and it's happening right under our noses in a, in a really ongoing way. But speaking of under our noses, um, a lot of these people have been deplatformed. Certainly the ringleader, the former president, has been deplatformed. Have you dipped your toe into Parler or any of the other social media platforms that have become the refuge of these people? Some of that reporting was informed by, you know, data dumps from Parler. Uh, I have a, a strange new set of uh, apps on my phone that are constantly pinging with uh, you know, conservative uh, voices that have in some cases been uh, either deplatformed or, or limited in some way on other platforms and are now, you know, firing off misses, uh, missives on Telegram uh, or Clubhouse is a new one. Ali Alexander, who's, uh, you know, alleged to have been one of the masterminds of the, the Stop the Steal uh, rally and, and the ensuing uh, riot on the Hill is someone who has, you know, started delivering essentially, you know, TED Talks on Clubhouse. So, that's another uh, new fun place that I, I gotta be. I think I should get hazard pay for Clubhouse. <laughs> you stay safe and don't spend too much time on social media. You can read Ronan's latest reporting in The New Yorker and on its website, 
NewYorker.com. Ronan Farrow, everybody. We'll be right back with Grammy Award winner Brandi Carlisle.